one, two, three, one, two, three. This is English, apparently. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Warmest greetings on behalf of the Surge Project. I'd like to welcome you into today's discussion because during the next two hours, we're going to be talking about inclusive and barrier-free environment for each and every person and the progress Ukraine has achieved so far on this path. This discussion was initiated by s the Surge Project together with the President's Office as well as the Ministry of Education and Science and Ministry of Social Policy. We're all aware of the today's reality and things we work on, depending on the age, physical capability, gender, status and other diversities. Many of us have been facing a lot of barriers. Those, those can be barriers in on our path to equal access to education, or there can be barriers to professional employment, or generally to the life in the society, when the society seems to never notice those people. And at the same time, we're all aware that those three factors, education, employment, and social life, are sometimes very decisive in terms of our success or not. They help self-employ ourselves. So it is very important to talk about this. And it is also important to mention that over the last years, Ukraine has adopted the number of strategic papers that are aimed at ensuring the right of every individual, every citizen for equality and inclusion. It's worth saying that one of the documents like this is the recently passed National Strategy for building barrier-free environment in Ukraine till 2030. Today we have 2021 and we are now discussing what one is supposed to do to build the state where each and every person will feel equal and feel accepted. And today we're going to be talking a, a bit about the details of how to build inclusive education for our children. Our discussion will be consisting of two panel discussions. In the first panel discussion, we're going to talk about the barrier-free society and what kind of government's role can be out there in building such a society. What means inclusion for children? And allow me to introduce the speakers of the first panel. Tanya Le Sanford Amari, Director of, uh, of uh, Alinea International in Ukraine and Surge Project Director. Daria Herasimchuk, Advisor to the Presidential Commissioner for Children's Rights and Child Rehabilitation. Tatiana Lomakina, Advisor to the Presidential Commissioner for Barrier-Free Issues. Dear friends, in the second part of our discussion, we're going to be discussing education as the main pillar of the children's lives because this is their path to the future and there can be a lot of barriers in there. And in that part of the discussion, we're going to invite uh, uh, Vi Vira Rogova, Deputy Minister of Education and Science of Ukraine, Boris Lebetsov, Deputy Minister of Social Policy of Ukraine, who will be connected through Zoom. And Zoya Boyko, a mother with experience of placing a child for inclusive education. So it's important to mention that some of uh, about some of the logistical things the broadcast will be seen by all the people from all over ukraine those will be representatives of government agencies as well as civil society and parents and teachers and all those who actually share the same vision for this issue they realize how much important it is to actually build this barrier-free inclusive society in ukraine and last but not least our broadcast is now handled in two languages, both English and Ukrainian. So it is high, high time to start right now. And the first question goes as follows. Isn't the every, each and every child who should have the right for happy childhood? 
And that's one of the parts of the surge project's uh, achievement together with the um, of Office of the President and the Ministry of Education and Science. Please watch the screen now. To know that you're important and feel love and care from your loved ones. To talk, learn, and be among the peers. This is happy childhood. Shouldn't each child feel that? accepting each other the way we are, instead of paying attention to the differences between ourselves. Helping each other to grow and develop his or her strengths. That kind of support and acceptance will break all the barriers and allow every child to build successful future. For children, barrier-free society. That's nice, isn't it? Very inspiring. And I have several questions to Tatiana Lamakina, advisor to the Presidential Commissioner for Barrier-Free Issues. Tatiana. As much as I understand, after watching the, the video, I can see that girl looks quite happy. She managed to communicate well with her peers. She is successful. And she even tries to actually facilitate the others to achieve success. This is an integrated policy. And despite there are certain uh, difficulties, but. I'm not going to be mistaken when I say that there are very few stories like this, I mean, of this positive side that we can see in our media. Uh, we know very little about achievements of those children with disabilities. And very rarely we can see those children be beyond their homes, I mean, somewhere else. Somewhere in the streets and on the playgrounds where they can play with their peers and friends. So here's my question. What do you think? Why is this so in Ukraine? Good morning, everybody. I'm so glad to welcome here the partners and the like-minded people. I think there are all people here who invest a lot into building barrier-free environment in Ukraine to that for that to become a real norm, a real standard. Lena Zelenska, the first lady had raised the issue of barrier-free society just because not all the kids in Ukraine who have disabilities have access to quality education, to integrated life in their societies, in their communities, respectively. So we realized the next step would be, once the child is growing, maybe even in a friendly environment at home, but that child may not be quite ready to learn enough to be well integrated in the society and to feel like you're a part of it and you're equal to the others. I think it is extremely important today to take steps forward and to build understanding of this for this purpose. The purpose is to make sure that education during the entire childhood to be able to yield results, to be able to develop the child, to make the child feel capable and equal to the other peers. What's happening right now, actually, we're now tr taking this journey all across Ukraine, across different regions. First of all, we have meetings with the decision makers, leadership of the local state administrations and regional ones. We also have meetings with the education department leaders. So we are discussing those issues and we are rising, uh, raising this issue, trying to put it on a daily agenda. So it is important that along with the issues that we are discussing today, um, and those are preparing for the winter, the heating season, the gas prices, COVID-19. But it's very important to also talk about those cross-cutting issues like building 
access for all children to education. And that has to be community-based. That is a really important issue for the entire country, for the state. Apart from inclusion, barrier-free environment is much broader than just inclusion. And I would like to ask how much Ukrainian society is ready for it. How much there is buy-in into that issue, especially when we talk about children with um, special educational needs. What we can observe right now is that Well, we just compare those children who go to inclusive classes, both with disabilities and without, and we compare them to those children who are older than grade four or five who never attended any inclusive classrooms. We can see a very important difference. The children who actually learn in inclusive classrooms, they know how to talk to each other, they are more accepting and they're supporting each other much better than the others. While we're, when we're talking about children without that experience, unfortunately, they believe mostly that people with disabilities, they are very specific, we need to take care of them, we need to actually uh, have special treatment for them, but there is no compassion and there is no equality sense in, in, in themselves. So it is important not only to make sure we have inclusive approach, not only for the children, but also for the entire society. As the children grow, they will ch be change their attitude. Their mindsets will be changed, as well as the mindsets of their parents. As the child goes to the first grade, to school, at school, we were asking, for instance, uh, the parents or sorry, the teachers at, at the daycare facilities, inclusive daycare facilities. We were asking, um, what would the parents say about inclusive daycare? But they say, no, you know, very few parents would like their children to go to inclusive classes. And uh, very few parents understand that this is the way to make their children much more um, understandable much more accepting. So it seems that if a child also has a child nearby with a special educational needs, those children show more acceptance. But I'd like to ask you about the strategy on how to build barrier-free environment in Ukraine, which has to happen well, somewhere before 2030. What kind of change have you seen already? Well, first and foremost, what we focus on these days, you know, the strategy is five or s has five or six very important components, including physical access or architectural accessibility at schools, universities, and daycare. The first thing that's now happening all over Ukraine, we are now performing accessibility audits, and therefore we build the registry. We uh, register all the schools and the kindergartens in terms of their accessibility. We realize it's not going to be fast. I mean, we need to have it finalized by 2030. But first of all, we need to change the mindset. That is a very important component when not only the state through the Ministry of Education and Science, as well as other ministries, tries to implement different standards and norms. But it's very important when those standards are taught for students, for daycare employees, for them to realize, understand, and correctly build inclusive education at their institutions and establishments. Because those children, those people are close to the children, and that's a very important component. When we look at mass media, for instance, we can see a lot of negative discourse and narrative. They say, oh, something is wrong in school number that, number that. And there is an impression that everything is bad. But we pay very little attention to those positive lessons learned and uh, great in integrational projects that are taking place in Ukraine. We just came back from Lviv, and in school number 50, we've seen inclusive classrooms where children go together, they're, they're growing together, they share the same success, and uh, that's very inspiring. I think we need to pay closer attention to those cases, to really demonstrate that the leaders at schools, the headmasters, are no longer afraid of it. Of course, inclusive classes is about responsibility. 
am I ready to create this environment? Am I ready to build accessible um, rooms and premises? So the leadership must not be afraid of it. And for that, we need to show that it is all possible. It's something new for them, but this is all doable. And we need to ask ourselves the question, am I ready to change and change the people around me? That's very important. You mentioned the accessibility and acceptance in the society. What kind of other criteria and areas that are reflected in the strategy? The strategy, of course, needs to also build awareness of what barrier-free society is. We need to deliver information in a concise and understandable, clear language. We need to also make the government websites accessible for different people with, for instance, the impairment of sight or hearing could actually also learn more about those services that are delivered. Informational accessibility is very important, and that is also a barrier-free environment in terms of information. There is also digital barrier-free environment where each and every territory in Ukraine has to be covered with internet. People need to also have access to all those services delivered by the state in terms of education, utility, banking, whatever. Y you name it. So not only the internet coverage is important, but also we need to make sure people could properly use their gadgets and all those applications that are developed for them. It is another awareness building component where we need to actually teach people and train people in terms of their digital skills. Another important thing mm, that's more economic, that the same thing that you mentioned at the very beginning, that we need to create opportunities for people to get their learning done, to get their employment, to build their families, to be well integrated into this entire society. And it is for that purpose that we incorporated economic barrier-free environment. We need to eliminate all the barriers to employment. Thank you. And here is my question again. Who should be responsible for developing this barrier-free environment? That's a very sound question, isn't it? When, when we just started this work, we were asking people, what do people think in Ukraine regarding who should be responsible for barrier-free society. 78% of Ukrainians admitted those have to be local governments, and 64 mentioned those are government agencies. So I think we need to build partnerships between central and regional and local governments to um, implement barrier-free environment everywhere. Has anyone mentioned themselves? Yes, 15%. Yes, those 15% of people realize they also bear this responsibility. Yes, they understand the input of each and every person will be important in this. Thank you very much, Tetyana. I'm convinced that uh, children do not have any barriers in communication until they go to school sometimes. And we need to teach our children of being different, of being um, more accessible, of being more tolerant to the others. But what would children need most of all? Please watch the screen now. Talking, having fun, and spending time with the peers. That's exactly what every child needs. It is important to accept every person the way he or she is and notice things that are important, really. Cool dancing. In our differences, we complete each other and become stronger. Come join us. To grow up in the equal society means that every child should have the same opportunities to build happy life and become a successful adult. For children, society without barriers. And today at this event, we have Daria Hersamchuk, advisor to the Presidential Commissioner for Human Rights and Child Rehabilitation. You represent the president's office, but at the same time, you're a mother. Uh -huh. But and the issue of children with hearing impairment um, is very relevant for you because you are taking care of such a child in your family. I would like you to share this your own story and tell us a bit about the difficulties you, that you're coming across. And you've had this experience already, I'm sure. Good morning. I'm so glad to be here because every information campaign, and especially when we're talking about these 
this campaign, which is trying to push forward this very important uh, issue for each and every child. To me, this is a very, very important day. The Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, made a big emphasis that protecting children's rights is a priority in our public policy. And each and every child should have the right for education. Indeed, I take care of the child with um, a hearing impairment. My child cannot hear anything. And she is 13 years old. Her name is Polina. And with the help of two implants, she learned how to talk. And she can hear now. She goes to a regular school. She, she, um, She's into hip hop dancing. So I would like to actually share this message with all the parents because I know it is difficult, especially these days with this COVID situation. But when we had started going to school and right now Polina is a grade seven student, so seven years of education, we've done that. And over this time we started realizing we have changed four schools, not just because we hated those two, or three, I'm sorry, but because I had to change my place of work and Polina was absolutely fine to go to a different school to see other children and make friends. So we've had this experience uh, um, and we've had one case which actually explains why information campaigns are so important. One of the teachers, when she learned from me, when she had learned from me that uh, my child has special educational needs and she is wearing the implants. The teacher then decided to call all the parents and just, she told her, okay, you, you talk to your parents, uh, to, to your children, please. Um, say that she has very, very expensive gadgets on her head and uh, if they break it, you're going to be responsible for it. So the parents would talk to their children, and at the end of the day, my child was full, absolutely in vacuum. She never communicated with anyone at school for almost six months, which had a bad impact on her. And we learned about this only after I was sitting next to her, and she was drawing with a black pencil. All the drawings were the black pencil. So every time I'm talking about this, and this is seven years back, I mean, I, I still have, uh, I'm, st I'm still a bit nervous, you know. She, she had been drawing always with colored pencils, with crayons, and then she turned to those black ones. So we started actually digging and finding the information, and we found out that the problem was not just because the teacher was bad, not because she wouldn't actually provide for anything, but actually the t teacher triggered this. No, it wasn't her fault, actually. That was just because of lack of information. The teacher would... would she wanted to do something good for my child. Parents of other children, they just wanted to feel safe on the one hand and on the other. Just because the teacher asked, they had to act accordingly. The thing is that the information campaign that could explain the moral responsibility of each and every person nearby, to be able to explain that my child is not special, she is just like the others. Every child has special needs. We need to understand this. There are children with disabilities. There are special educational needs. Sa they are the same children. And the, we have never to isolate them into a separate category. And we should never say that if we have th such a child in the classroom, we need to take care of him or her. We need to treat him or her specially. That creates a lot of misunderstanding between the teachers and the parents because they perceive this child as uh, an element of concern, on concern, something that needs to change their behavior or life. I need to be, I need to be more sensitive. I need to be more caring. I, I need to be friendlier. I'm sure that we need to provide opportunities for everyone to develop without exclusion, without creating categories. We just need to create an enabling environment. What kind of environment should that be? This is an environment when parents talk to their children in the right way. When Just pay attention to our information campaign for children, barrier-free society. You can read it differently, actually. For children, the barrier-free society. Because children are f looking at those barriers without a problem. 
they see no barriers actually the barriers are for the adults and if parents start telling this to their children okay this is a barrier because this child is on a wheelchair then children start thinking this way it all comes from parents mainly at the very beginning children think nothing about this if but if a mother says don't worry maybe you uh, have you cannot talk perfectly well but that's fine okay my child also uh, faces challenges when talking sometimes mm, because she cannot pick the right words sometimes but that's true for everybody even for I mean for anyone here sometimes you can find r proper words we can read the name of the campaign mm, differently for children society without barriers but this can be focused on the adults not the children so adults have to think how to eliminate those barriers for their children if parents start realizing that it's not worth giving giving away leadership to the other children but not yours okay no you you can't be a leader because you have special educational needs let it be the others no that's a wrong thing to do if the headmaster at school says okay parents you need to fix that issue between yourselves how you handle the case because we have a special educational needs in our classroom no that's wrong i need i think we need to be inclusive and once every person understand that it's the child who is in the center of everything then it's going to work so it should be a collective responsibility for all of the children Definitely. We are the grown-ups and we are responsible for our children. If we don't seed stereotypes in them, if we're not saying, okay, that little boy uh, is on the wheelchair, so you need to show your compassion. Or Paulina, she cannot hear anything, so, okay, try to, to, to be nice with her. We need to forget about that. We need to think that's not the child with special educational needs, but that's just Michael, that's just Polly, that's just John. And not John with special educational needs. What kind of other um, barriers to inclusion, that me as, as mentioned by parents? Actually, the President Commissioner is a co coordinating body. Who can actually coordinate different agencies, um, institutions, this is an advisory body and anyways i'm not an executive body people sometimes look for solutions and rescue in the other people over the last three months that i've been filling the job of the president's commissioner for children's rights and child rehabilitation i received so many requests for help and you know those requests can be broken down into two, two categories one category is when parents we're saying those guys are bad they're doing nothing i need to have an elevator at my child's school and those guys never did it there are parents who do not see any kind of opportunity for compromise i'm not sure it's saying that uh, leadership at school or at the government agencies have to be distant from those issues okay there is no elevator who cares i don't i'm not trying to say this okay there is no adaptation to the learning environment we don't care no, it's wrong. We need to all be ready for the compromise. But there are people who are doomsayers. They keep saying everything's bad, everything's not perfect, things don't work. Um, I would actually try to convince people to have a different narrative. Okay, we have something, but we need to have that something improved. And uh, we need to have inputs from many different stakeholders. For that, we need to engage them. If an information campaign um, produces the results and outcomes that we expect, and we want those videos to be seen in every school, in every um, IERC, the resource centers, I mean, uh, we need to see that all the people have should have equal access and only once we build this awareness then the leadership will realize the money has to be allocated there uh, we should not be afraid to give it a try to find a compromise and at least kickstart the process can you be more specific what uh, the money has to be allocated for what's missing there on the ground in the down in the communities what kind of challenges do they have to face and um, 
handle to integrate those children in the societal life as well as in the educational facilities at schools. What I'd like to m emphasize right now is that I didn't want to use the word fight against the problems because fight is about the battle. We need to work, we need to build and create and not to fight for them. That's the first point. Regarding where the money should go and how it now goes, I think we're going to be talking uh, I think the colleague from the Ministry of Education and Science will tell a bit about this, and um, he will share the figures as well. But regarding what we're supposed to do and um, to, to make sure the children can fully participate in the life of the society, to have equal access to education, that's, um, that comes from parents and families of, their chil of those children who learn in the first instance about their special need. The special need should not mean automatically that that's disability. This early intervention when th that is important when parents, once they learn about any kind of impairment or Im even potential risk of disability, when the children can go somewhere and get their early intervention. If that's, uh, that works, then they will be more prepared they will be prepared to tell their child about this. It's a good thing that you mentioned we're not fighting, but we're building and we are delivering for. Thank you very much for your comments and thanks very much for sharing the personal story, Daria. So we heard about the problems that we and also the children with disabilities in their families are facing in their education and building their success. It is high time to speak about the international experience and best practices that are being implemented in other countries. And in the today's event, we have Tanya Lee Sanford Amar, Surge Project Director, and Alina International Director in Ukraine, who has experience of implementing reforms for the social inclusion of the vulnerable children in their families in m many different countries, including Ukraine. And I'm going to switch into English. And please, for those who need translation, put on your headsets. <laughs> Could you please uh, tell us what is Canada's approach to uh, education of children with special needs and integrating them back into community's life? Uh, thanks, thanks very much uh, for hosting this, this session. It's Thank you. It's my pleasure. Um, I, you know, I should say, first of all, I'm not uh, a special education counselor. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for the technical assistance on that. Uh, I, I should say, first of all, that I'm not uh, necessarily an expert on special educational needs, uh, but we have been running a project on building services for children to keep them out of institutions in Ukraine uh, for a number of years now. And the issues of special education, inclusive education, are really critical and central to solving the issue of huge numbers of children that reside in institutions across Ukraine. And like Daria, I have a bit of experience as a parent as well, uh, as a parent of two children, uh, both of which who have had special education needs. And I've had to manage that issue myself uh, when my son was younger in Canada and uh, with my daughter now. Um, both of them are doing very, very well. They have uh, issues with attention deficit disorder, ADD, dyslexia, that's when you can't necessarily read, uh, dysgraphia, which is you can't write, uh, dyscalculia. So my kids have it all. And uh, so I have a lot of experience uh, in Canada as a parent trying to find services uh, for my own children. And um, so first of all, I, I should say about Canada, we're a federation. So the way we handle things like education and health depends uh, from province to province. It's a provincial responsibility, not a federal one. Uh, that said, we have overarching principles about how we 
approach those particular issues. So w what I'm going to say uh, applies to the country generally, but it can be kind of implemented or expressed in different ways uh, depending on where you are. Um, and second, it's, it's also uh, different depending on whether you're in an urban center or rural, so you know, your access to services, I think, is a challenge no matter what country you're in to be able to provide the services you need uh, for children in an equal way, right? It's much more difficult to provide special services for kids that live in a rural area than, than in an urban area. Uh, it's the same everywhere. Um, but generally, the principle in Canada is that we have an individual approach to children. So things like Daria was mentioning before, there's an assessment of children. And this is something that we, we definitely need to start with. Understanding what the problems are, what the issues are, what the learning needs are, or potentially how to accommodate physical or even mental differences with children is the first step. Right? So that happens with doctors, that happens with teachers, and with parents themselves. There has to be that first initial assessment, uh, and then uh, adaptations and accommodations to help work with those, those children. So much like Ukraine, um, our approach in Canada has, has been an evolution, right? So 60, 50, 60 years ago, which doesn't, it sounds like a very long time, but I realize this, we're talking the 70s, um, when I was born, so it's, it, it doesn't feel like it should be that long ago, but uh, 50, 60 years ago, I mean, the choices were uh, really, like I think a lot of parents face in other countries, that you either keep your child at home and you manage these issues at home and you homeschool, or you send your child to an institution, right? Um, and in the late 70s, that started to change in Canada. Uh, it was an understanding that um, this is not the way that we should be working with these children, that we should be keeping them home, and we should be uh, mainstreaming them into school. So we moved into mainstreaming children in school, and then at, at that time, it was started off with specialized classes, right? But then it's moved more into mainstreaming within the classroom. So today, we have a situation in Canada where 60% of children are mainstreamed into standard classrooms. So despite what their learning needs are and uh, what maybe differences they have. And then you have some children that might be pulled out for specialized classes, you know, another 30%, let's say. And it's only a really small number of kids that would be in specialized educational classes within the school. We tend to use techniques where either specialists come into the classrooms, they call it a push-in, or they pull out the children for specialized sessions. And I think the other major difference is we don't um, really have specialized schools. We have some special schools, but very few. Uh, because we recognize that it's really important for children to stay at home with their families and in their communities. Yes, you're saying that uh, children with special needs are mainstreamed into regular schools in Canada. Could you please tell us what are the benefits of such an approach? Well, I think uh, to explain the benefits, it's important, first of all, to think about why we don't mainstream. And I think Daria said a lot about this a few minutes ago. The overriding approach, the long-standing thinking around this has been, this child has special needs, this child is different, therefore we will take them and put them in a special environment and we will give them special approaches. Now, part of that is right. They do need special approaches, special techniques. We need to give them additional attention because of the differences they have in order to give them an equal playing field. But the part that has been understood to be incorrect through global research over the last decades is that children don't need to be segregated for that, right? You don't need to put them in a physically separate space. And in fact, it actually has really negative consequences. So, you know, if you, if you keep them, first of all, segregated, I mean, the worst, worst possible outcome is to keep them se uh, segregated in a separate institution, right? Away from family, uh, away from their community, away from siblings, away from, uh, from friends. Um, but you can also have segregation within, a, a, within school when you keep them in a separate classroom. Um, and then even as Daria said, you can even have segregation within a classroom. Inadvertently, you know, people trying to, to, with great intentions, trying to be helpful, sometimes there's segregation still happening. 
But when you have segregation, you don't have that opportunity for contact, for communication, right? And distance creates misunderstanding and doesn't provide the opportunity for children without differences, children with differences, to, to meet each other and understand each other and develop normal relationships. So, you know, when we look at this in terms of benefits, you want to look at two things. You want to look at education. Uh, first, uh, we know from research educational outcomes are much better when children are integrated into standard classrooms. That, is, that has been proven with research. But second, socially. That's very important too because we're all social creatures and you know, uh, as Daria's example uh, showed, nobody wants to be separate or different or excluded. We all want to be together, right? So it's obviously beneficial for children. I would say especially beneficial for children who already have differences or special needs. On top of that, to be segregated from everybody else, I think is, is terribly damaging. But I also think there's a benefit for the other kids who do not have differences to have those kids in their classroom. I think they learn from each other. They understand each other. They have an opportunity to practice empathy and understanding, uh, which I think is just beneficial for us all. Of course. As uh, Ms. Lamakina was saying, when kids start build, building relationship with the kids with uh, special needs, they learn the empathy, basically, yes? And I would like to ask you, uh, considering the international experience that you have and considering your knowledge of pitfalls of the current uh, child welfare system here in Ukraine, uh, what advice would you give to the Ukrainian government in regard of their goal uh, of uh, developing an inclusive and barrier-free society here in Ukraine? Well, first of all, I think I think Daria is right in terms of um, Ukraine loves to criticize itself. I've, I've lived here a very long time and uh, a friend of mine would say Ukraine is the scorpion that stings itself often. I think it's very true. Pessimists. Uh, yes, and maybe rightly so. Maybe some people always tell me, no, we're not pessimists, we're realists. Um, but that being said, I think that uh, Ukrainians love to criticize Ukraine. And I want to say one positive thing here. Uh, the fact that we're talking about a barrier-free society tells me that Ukraine is becoming a mature country. I mean, as, as you said earlier, uh, Tanya, when you're looking at issues like COVID, uh, gas prices, uh, we have a conflict uh, with, with Russia. When we have all of these things happening, and still we're talking about these kinds of issues like creating a barrier-free society, that tells me that we are no longer a, a country on the verge of crisis all the time, but we are starting to look to the future and starting to look at what kind of country we want to have, what kind of principles, what kind of values does this country have, and starting to put money behind it. And I think that's incredibly important, um, and I, I think that's a very, very positive, very positive sign. So um, I think we're on the right track, and I think there's a lot of really great pieces that have been in, uh, put into place in terms of the provision of inclusive education for children. It's, that's great. So by legislation, everybody has, should have access to inclusive education. But I would say that there's three things that I think we should be focused on generally, and they're all kind of interconnected. Uh, the first one is, I think, overall, we have to ensure that we have a system that is child-centric. And this is something that we still don't have here in Ukraine. Uh, we have a, a system that is in places child-centric, but if it's truly a child-centric system, it is based on the best interests of each individual child. And it's not just a platitude. I mean, we say things like this, right? It should be child-centric, and children are our future, and every child has the potential to do everything. These are platitudes, we say. But they are only platitudes because we don't put any action and any money behind it, right? So if we want to have a truly child-centric system, we have to make sure that what we are doing is individually appropriate and the best choice we can possibly make for each child that we are encountering. So again, that starts off with each child being assessed, right? Looking at what do they need and what can they and what can we do for them to help address the issues they have. And 
that leads to, to the second point, which is we have to ensure that this legislative imperative, this legislative access to inclusive education is realized in practice. And um, I, I, this is, to me, important for uh, parliament to consider. It is important in terms of the budget of Ukraine. We need to put money behind this. And access to services needs to be opened now. The burden should not be placed on parents. The burden should not be placed on parents to make an application to have access to inclusive education. That's not in the best interest of children because that is a, a long period of time for that child to have access to services. And the reality is there are children with special needs everywhere. I mean, if you just look at this panel here, Daria and I, there's th at least three children uh, between us that all have special needs. And I would, I would guess that that is probably the case across the country. Children with special needs with differences are everywhere. What are we waiting for? Why are we waiting for somebody to come and say, oh, I need inclusive education? No, we need to build the system now so it's ready for each child this year, next year, 10 years from now. Uh, and just the third thing I would say is we need, again, to focus on an individualized approach with children. So again, assessment, uh, understanding what each child needs, and we need to move away from institutions. Because that is not in the best interest of, ch of children that is convenient. It's a convenient way to provide services uh, to families. Uh, but we are doing everybody a disservice here because we have a system of institutions that we continue to fund, people continue to be employed in, and if you continue to put money in it, we're going to just grow the system of institutions and we're not going to be able to redirect that financing uh, to services. So, so those are the three things that I would, I would recommend. Thank you. Very powerful words, and thank you for your clarifications and recommendations. Thank you very much, Daria and Tatiana. And now we're going to focus on discussing the key aspect of life for each and every child, which is education. This is the path to the bright future, and this is also the, the place where the child can face a lot of barriers unless the child receives support. And school is the daily child's, so to say, employment. This is where they spend most of their time during the day. This is where they interact with the others. This is where they meet each other. And they build their social skills. So education is a very important component for preparing the child for adult life. Children with special educational needs, however, are not included into regular school and societal life because many of them uh, study individually from homes or at home, I'm sorry, or they go to specialized ed schools that we just talked about and Tanya mentioned this. The Ukrainian legislation have, has recognized the importance of inclusive education. Moreover, it actually guarantees the right of every child for inclusive education. But is that so in practice? Can all the children in Ukraine have access to inclusive education? So we are starting our second panel discussion right now. And we will start with a real story of a mother who has had the experience of placing the child or from, um, of placing the child for inclusive education. Please pay attention to the screen. Nastya was born 10 years ago. She had many, many needs. And we were going from on and on to see the doctors. And then we were, uh, we were sent to the rehabilitation center for children. And after two months, I've seen that Nastya, after the classes, she started singing and copying gestures. Of course, in that institution, there was a team of professionals. But she talked very little to the peers. She was playing on her own. She never talked to anyone. Even attending the lavatory was scheduled. 
And when Na Nastia was seven years old, we were lucky to be accepted in, in a different kindergarten. Uh, there were inclusive classrooms, and there were three children with special educational needs, and she started talking to the people. So I thought, we have to go to a regular school after the, this daycare facility. But at school, they, they wouldn't understand what to do with those children, what, kind of, what inclusion meant. So we just realized it's very difficult to train the teachers who have never learned anything and knew anything, uh, known anything about inclusion and special education needs. This, the school could not actually reject us, so I went to that school, I applied to it, and on the 28th of August, in a school meeting at the end, the teacher said, oh, you're lucky, you have everything, you have a, a school assistant, you have the speech therapist. You know, people do not even believe that things have changed. This process has just started, and we need to continue that. But actually, any school can accept a child with special educational needs. Anyone. And that's most important. Regular life, normal conditions, good school for my child. I would never even expect this. I think we just need to socialize children with special educational needs and adapt them to, to normal life, for them to be able to live on equal conditions with the others. Dear friends, we are lucky to have Mr. Zoya Boyko today, today with us in this room. Uh, we also have Ira Rogova, Deputy Minister of Education and Science. And we also ha we're, we're going to have uh, Boris uh, Lebetsov, Deputy Minister of Social Policy, who will connect on Zoom. Zoya, the question goes to you first. Let us come back two, three years ago. And please let us recall how did that happen? First of all, in a video, before the video, you, you, you said that um, you, you were not accepted by no school principal, no one else. This was five years ago when my daughter went to the, kin to the, the, the daycare facility. She was just two years old. When she was two, during rehabilitation, one of the doctors said, we need to ensure rehabilitation of the child because the child is not developing. Before we were two years old, nobody even said, nobody had said that we, we had many problems. We had no, we had family, some family members who said, okay, our child would not talk until five years old. So one, when we ended up in the rehabilitation, one of the doctors actually recommended a civil society organization where we went to and they told us where to go to and there i th started thinking oh, okay we were we were we decided to go to 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 go to the kindergarten with a child i mean there were very few specialized daycare facilities there was a commission where you had to go to and um, before you are admitted to the kindergarten for instance we came to the commission meeting um, but we were told after talking to the daughter, they said that she has a cerebral paralysis. And that I came over a week after and asked if they could look at my daughter once again. But she had she has a developmental disorder. So we went there two, for two or three years uh, to that institution. Everything was scheduled there. Everything seemed, seemed to be right, but. Um, I couldn't see any kind of socialization opportunity. So you mean the first commission was not uh, c c competent enough? You know, they were continuously um, finding and trying to diagnose something else in, in my child. That was quite stressful for the parents and the child herself. So we ended up in a, in a daycare facility. We spent time there until she was seven and then they said okay you need to go to school you're seven now your daughter is i mean so we're thinking about an institution we have one in our district quite 
quite a good one actually. And, but then we went to a different daycare facility with an inclusive classroom. But but they had autism children, um, developmental disorder children, and also the Down syndrome children. But we ended up there actually. We managed to, and for just one year, the situation has changed a lot. The child started talking to the others. I had n I had nothing to say, nothing wrong to say. Nobody ever said that our child is just different uh, and just very specific. Okay, when she was eight, there wouldn't be any legislation nor provisions whatsoever, but the schoolmaster could actually, uh, I mean, the uh, principal at school, principals at school could uh, themselves decide whether they accept this ch no, the, that kind of children or not. And the, the principal would not even understand uh, in the first school where we went to what inclusion was, whether she needs a separate classroom or something. She said, no, the same classroom like the other children, but she needs an assistant. But the headmasters complained that, okay, if I accept the child, I will be facing a problem. If I didn't deny your child, then I'm going to be sued and they will dismiss me. But they said, you're not going to, they said to me, I'm, I, I wasn't going to get anything from this. I mean, it's, it wouldn't work. And I, I was kept, um, they kept asking me, what, what will the, your child be doing there? How can the child survive? You know, other children will offend her. So then we took a risk and went to the school next doors, next to our house. Well, I talked to this to the school principal and she told me, "Okay, we have a mathematic um the uh, the classroom, uh, I mean our class is with um, where the children have their major at math. They called the school psychologist and she explained to me again that, Mother, you you do not understand. It's going to be difficult for your daughter to study here. And I was responding like, okay, the, uh, in other countries, children with special educational needs go to regular cl cl classrooms. They have, all those people had very biased attitude. Who would like to send a, uh, send a child to the school where the child is not accepted? S so we spent one year in an institution. Yes, it was um, a full day f institution. Legally, I mean, the, the, the school... Uh, any school cannot actually deny a child like this. But then I went to a different school and we came with all the papers and ultimately we were accepted. In grade one we had the teacher and the school assistant and in grade two we had the new teacher and the new assistant So right now the situation is much better. We're communicating so well. There are no longer issues like we faced before. So everything's great. So you finally ended up in the same school where you went to before. And then you were told your child will not be comfortable here. So can you please tell us how much the school in those days was ready or not ready to accept the children with special educational needs and whether over the last two years anything has changed. Well, we now have the ramp at school, for instance. Is it is it comfortable to use? Yes, it is, but we don't have any children yet who are on wheelchairs. But it's not only for the, for the children, it's sometimes for other people as well. For instance, our classroom is on the fourth floor and there is no elevator. 
nobody ever explained to me how they will be using this staircase. Honestly, over the last four years, I haven't seen anyone, anyone with the, with the apparent disability, but it seems to me that um, my daughter is just uh, the one child with special educational needs. How has the Anastasia's life changed while she is studying there? A big advantage is that she feels comfortable. She cannot explain everything. Well, she needs time for it. But throughout the, this time, I can clearly state that she has never mentioned that she wouldn't go. She wouldn't want to go to school. She has her favorite subjects at school, like design and technology classes, and she loves this. She can't wait until the next one to come. And in the first year of study, I didn't know that, but I was told a year later that she was sitting separately. I mean, the teacher wouldn't uh, let anyone talk to her and come over close closely to her. And from grade two, when uh, um, we had the school psychologist as a teacher and she created a proper atmosphere. And I know there are some of the children who tried to help out try to help her go down the stairs or up the staircase and I've never known of any kind of incidents at school with my daughter had it started since the daycare facility it would have been even better we're so glad that you have this positive experience thank you very much for sharing Vera now I'd like to ask you please <laughs> have discussed this situation with Zoya and now we understand there is the law of Ukraine that makes it binding for all the schools and daycare facilities to create um, inclusive conditions and classrooms for the children. But what if a school denies your application? What should the parents do in this situation in accordance with the new legislation? Thank you very much Oleg for the question. Zoya, I've I'm very sorry that at the very beginning mm, the school denied you and your daughter and there was probably a certain misunderstanding happened. So we understand that everything is quite well today. But today the schoolmasters, the headmasters have a huge responsibility because this is a principal at school who's responsible for his or her school where he or she works. And depending on how comfortable the children are how comfortable the teachers are and how much inclusion there is, that is the responsibility of the headmaster. Right now the headmasters and principals have all the rights. They have the financial autonomy, organizational, log logistical autonomy. They have all the powers to build inclusive um, education environment. For us, as for the central government agency, which is the Ministry of Education and Science, this is a priority, and Tatiana already mentioned today, she me mentioned the national barrier-free strategy, but not only that barrier-free strategy till 2030 that is important. We have another national strategy to build safe environment f for at the new Ukrainian school, where inclusion is one of the top priorities. We want to thank the First Lady, Olena Zelenska, for taking very serious emphasis on this, because the child, any child, according to our legislation, according to our morality and principles and values, we need to make sure we provide all the high quality service delivery to each and every child, depending on the child's needs. Whether this is gonna be the child with specific educational needs, or this is a child who goes to the uh, school where ethnic minor minorities uh, learn and um, they do not have any command of the national language. So the school principal, first of all, shall be responsible for it. And Zoya, I'd like to tell to you and all the parents, whenever there are cases, when you come with the conclusion of the inclusive, inclusive Education Resource Center, and if you're denied at school, you need to sub sub lodge a complaint to the education department in your region. If you are discarded there, or if your application was never considered, you have the full right to uh, com complain to the Ministry of Education. Now we understand everything logistically, how the communication should be built to make sure it is efficient enough. 
for the people to be able to defend their rights. But I would like to ask you, given the surge's recent study, it has shown that many parents are not even aware that their children can go to inclusive classrooms. But I'd like to ask you about the procedure itself. Could you share a bit of information about how it works? How to correctly send an application and finally uh, for your child to be accepted at the inclusive classrooms. We have 400 and uh, 648 inclusive education research centers. Those centers now are involved in correctional work and also they make the assessment, what Tanya mentioned. So this is an advisory body, isn't it? It is. They make a conclusion, which is an official one, and with that conclusion, with that sort of statement from the Inclusive Education Research Center, they parents go to school, and the school principal mm, cannot deny that child. We also have a, an objective right now that each and every school has to be inclusive. But unfortunately, that's not the case yet. We only have 43% of schools that have inclusive classrooms. However, like Tanya mentioned, until 2030, we need to make sure each and every school is inclusive. And we should wait until 2030 comes. If there are parents and there is a child, they must have the service delivered. But I'd like to draw your attention to two centric things. We have central government, where the state is doing a lot to develop inclusive education in Ukraine. As compared to 2017, for instance, back then we had 200 million hryvnia for children with special educational needs as this public subvention. Today, in 2021, this is for half a billion arena, which is quite substantial money to deliver services properly to our children. Moreover, we have many inclusive education resource centers and their employees get salaries from the state. 52 million arena was allocated to support children with special educational needs in terms of textbooks. And in the government allocated 490 million to procure school buses. We still have the demand for 72 more buses, specifically for children with special educational needs. But right now we are running a big awareness raising campaign among the uh, teachers. We need to train those teachers. Those have to be highly professional with competencies and values that are required for inclusive education. Tell us a bit more details about this, how to train them, who will train them. All the teacher training institutes and universities, they do train those teachers. But since the beginning of the inclusive resource centers, we realize we don't have enough people. And just recently there was the accounting chamber meeting where we were discussing that issue. So we realized that today we're m missing those professionals. That's why the teacher training institutions need to now collect information. How many more professionals do we need to deliver services to children with special educational needs? What kind of professionals are those? Those are teachers, the pathologists, psychologists, social workers, etc. And we have more than 24,000 professionals of this, of this nature, but they're not enough. Regarding those people who work at the Inclusive Education Resource, uh, Resource Center, based on the um, vet schools and uh, in-service training institutions, they can be actually trained there. But the IERCs are specifically established to help deliver services to the children with special educational needs. Plus, we are supported very much by a lot of international organizations and projects. We are so grateful to them because they have invested a lot into training those professionals. But we need to all realize that at the school, at every school, it is the child who should be in the center. For instance, if the child needs 
the Ukrainian language classes, we need to deliver that. If we have children with special educational needs, we need to provide for that child to make sure there is quality education at a regular school, which is guaranteed by the Ukrainian legislation. So it is the principal who's in charge, whatever happens at school. Uh, so teachers will be retrained or vocationally trained to be able to work with the children with sp special educational needs. And the new professionals uh, will be trained uh, as there will be the uh, government request for it. Oleg, I would like to also add here that at the local level, I want to thank you very much because we're putting together everybody. So it is important not to have, you know, mm, we need to have the buy-in from the society. We want to make sure the society does not remain reluctant. We have several ways to do that. We have inclusive education, there is individual learning opportunity, and there is also the specialized schools. And we're not refraining from that, because some parents need to create conditions for their children. There are illnesses and disorders in children when they need to go to such schools, specialized schools, I mean. But I'm going to mention one figure here. More than 12,000 children uh, learn individually at home. And this is a question to all of us, especially the Ministry of Education and Science. We're working a lot on this. We realize those, not all those children have to study individually. For those children not to be set aside and left alone, we need to deliver quality services. And that's the call for our inclusive resource centers. Now, now right now, we have put together the statute on the inclusive education resource centers. They need to deliver correctional classes, make the assessment, and f finalize the assessment uh, findings that are put into the official paper. We need to pay close attention to those children who study individually at home. So we're constantly monitoring the financial resources allocated, also the service quality that is ensured at schools. Those individual uh, learning schemes, they are not very good ones, because in terms of the hours taught for each individual subject, uh, individual education is twice less intensive. And the question is, will the child be able to go to the university after the distant learning practiced throughout the school, school life? 12,000 children do not have access to communicating to their peers, and that's horrible, isn't it? For us, this figure is very huge, and we need to, to need to talk to the community leaders, to the entire society, because the community, the school, and the parents, if we put all those efforts together, I think we can solve a lot. Well, we're going to talk with Boris. He's going to be with us very soon over Zoom. And I would like to ask you, well, you mentioned that 43% of schools in Ukraine have inclusive classrooms. And that means that more than 50% of schools do not yet have access to inclusive education. And roughly, we can make a conclusion that Probably 50% of the Ukraine's territory is not covered by inclusive education in the classrooms. What should we do with that? Well, there are objective reasons. Maybe there are no, there are no children with special educational needs, but there is also a positive trend here. Tatiana also uh, mentioned that Ukrainians are, are criticizing themselves. Tanya mentioned this. Over the last two years, I should say, uh, 
we have much greater coverage by inclusive classrooms. Five times the growth is. Five years ago, we had 4,000 children attending inclusive classrooms. Now this is over 25,000 children. Well, we have 15,000 schools today. And there is a great demand for inclusive education. Because some kids learn from home, others are um, attending specialized schools. But what the positive trend is that the parents, parents start trusting us much more. And those schools have to be built, I mean, inclusive schools. Right now we have more than 18,000 classrooms with inclusive education, which is a very good KPI. It has grown six times. And even more to say, we have a nine times increase in the assistant teachers who work with our children. There are also 19,000 of them, nine times more than we'd had before. So we're not standing alone, we keep going forward, keep uh, evolving, but it's not enough because to each parent and to each child, we need to deliver the services the child needs. And if parents need special education for their children, then they, c they can have one. But it is very important that in at the specialized schools where they deliver services to children, parents should understand that they have an opportunity to take their kids back home every evening but in some of the rural areas, for instance, where people have to travel like 40, 60 or even 100 kilometers, and then those children are sent to the institutions. And then that's, that's the, the, the question. But those institutions are also available. We should, though, create a good balance. For those children who can go to school, they have to go to school. The previous speakers already said this today. Thank you very much, Vera, for your answer. Dear friends, in order to raise awareness of the parents regarding the inclusive education opportunities and advantages, the pre President's administration, uh, with the support of the project, developed a video. Every child has the right to be taken care of in families. No child should be isolated from the society. Thousands of children have special education needs, do not have access to education in regular schools or study individual at home. Mom, I want to go to school too. Nowadays, inclusive education is an opportunity for children to be with their families and learn about the world with their, with their peers. Or 25 children, 25,000 children go to the homes, uh, go to the schools next to their homes, I beg your pardon. <laughs> They're listening. They are listening online as well. I'm getting blind. Every child has the right to inclusive education. All right, we have Boris Lebetsov, Deputy Minister of Social Policy, over Zoom with us. Boris, good morning, good afternoon. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you, Boris. We just had a conversation with Vera about responsibility, responsibility of government agencies and uh, local leadership and s headmasters. But there is a question about the communities. We know that the social service reform has started yet uh, now. And what kind of services are now available for children with special educational needs and children with disabilities and their families uh, on the community-based level? Thank you very much for this question. First of all, I'd like to express words of gratitude for this opportunity to speak to you today. Of course, I wanted to be offline with you, but we now have a lot of events, and especially one important one uh, is with the World Bank. So unfortunately, I'm here over Zoom with you. I'm fully supportive of what uh, what our colleagues have said, that it is in the best interest of the community to take care of this. We're actively working on this. Under the decentralization reform, a lot of powers were moved to the community level. And that's a question to the community leaders. 
whether they realize what their responsibility is, their responsibilities are. And um, we're continuously raising this issue. According to our estimates, we need to have at least 20, uh, 12,000 social workers. At the beginning of the year, we had 3,000. And um, the Parliament of Ukraine, together with, uh, with our government, have taken a lot of steps to finance salaries, the, the communities to, to, to be able to pay the salaries to the social workers. Unless the community leaders are interested in handling the, those issues, um, we're not going to be able to um, implement the reform effectively enough. When the communities know about the children in their community who have special educational needs, unless they know about the child's specific needs, they're not going to be able to handle anything. So today, this situation uh, is changing. So we actually monitor the overall situation together with the service for children. So this way, we're developing inclusive education. As for the law of Ukraine on social services, indeed, within decentralization, a lot of basic social services were moved down to the communities. But what, what kind of problems we're facing these days and why uh, things are not being implemented so fast? Uh, there are a lot of communities that are being very active. They're really encouraged to implement new things. And um, the regional social service centers now run special programs to train um, professionals on how to do the needs assessment of children to then deliver proper services, community-based services. But I'd like to tell you a bit about the services that are now available. This is the daycare, which is a social service for children between 3 and 15 years old who have physical or or, or other Im impairments or in, in disorders. The services can be delivered during the working hours by the social service centers. Throughout this time, parents can go to work or do something that they need to. Children uh, get um, tr uh, they have their training, their learning, uh, their leisure, food, and everything. One of the other basic services, which has to be community based, which is the temporary rest for children or or individuals who are taking care of the child. This service is provided to um, parents mainly. In terms of temporary care for the children on a community basis, there is also assistance, a, a service that has to do with the assistance while learning. Right now, we are still testing this service and we are getting a lot of feedback, in, including negative. Hopefully, soon the standard will be submitted to the Ministry of Justice. These are the services to assist children in their learning. Excuse me, Boris. This assistance and temporary care services, you are saying that the community is to finance all those services, but do we, ha do we have enough people in the communities right now to deliver those services? That's a very good question. We are actively working on it. Because under decentralization, every, every community leader needs to understand that social issues are as important as infrastructure development and others. Because first of all, people pay a lot of attention to renovations on roads, but many leaders w before elections had very little understanding that they also responsible for social, the social aspects. So this is also their responsibility. 
all that has to be delivered on a community basis. They get the money for social services, and the situation is getting better. According to the Service for Children, uh, right now, services for children are mm, established in most of the amalgamated communities. And that's the first step to actually protect the rights of children. There are services for children together with the leadership in the community, and there are social workers who are taking care of those issues. We invest a lot into building uh, these the social institutions on the ground. So, like I said, we had 3,000 social workers at the beginning of the year, but with pilot projects, we have increased this number by another thousand. The more social workers we have, the better the situation will be because we will be uh, able to identify those individuals in need much earlier and therefore we will be able to deliver much better tailor-made services to them. So with the support of the presidential commissioners Tatiana Lomakina and Daria Hrasemchuk, we are now implementing the early intervention system since birth and that's a major step forward for those issues to be uh, handled properly in Ukraine. That's why the social workers are very important right now as an institution, as not just individual professionals, but as an institution that is largely supported by both the government and, and the parliament. So we do everything possible to develop this framework. Thank you very much, Boris. So you're trying to say that the f money is on the ground, the social workers are being trained, and actually the needs will, the, the inclusive education will be most of all the responsibility of the community leadership. What if a community leader in a certain uh, area is not interested in inclusive education? What should the parents do then? And what should they do logistically? Well, nobody doubts that those people cannot complain to the ministry. Sometimes we uh, get the complaints and trying to interfere with the situation. We explain the uh, importance of inclusive education to the community leaders and of the importance to deliver those services. Like I said, in the decentralization, the even beforehand when we had those rayons, the districts, their leadership was not even aware of what inclusion was about. Now we are trying to work closely with all the local government representatives and service delivery agencies to actually start to build a proper understanding of what inclusion is all about. So we are developing the support framework. And here is something I would like to mention here. We have established the a uh, pilot project call, called uh, Social Service Development. And we allocated 10 million hryvnias. We, a lot, we, we received a lot of applications. And um, this is an opportunity to take advantage of the government, of the public uh, financial resources that can be actually invested into the improvements in the social de so service delivery framework. Uh, of course, they should first, uh, first of all assess their risks and needs, and then they can apply for funding. If there are community leaders who do not believe inclusion is important, please, you can s lodge this complaint or send information to us, and we will be responding. But I'd like to ask you about barriers in the service develop service delivery, because when you're mentioned the lack of social workers, I want to mention that there are departments at universities who train professionals of this kind. 
But what kind of barriers do you have? Why don't we have those services properly developed? And how? what are the ways to overcome them? Thank you for the question. I wouldn't say about barriers. There should be goodwill. But again, we're coming back to the community leadership. First of all, there should be awareness of basic social services that have to be made available at the community level. But we cannot oblige the community leader. However, we insist on this. We cannot oblige them to hire social workers. L the leaders have to create jobs. Me we're working a lot on this. There are many pilot projects here. We're saying, OK, uh, you hire a social worker, then you're going to get support from the state, either um, monetary or, I don't know, procurement-wise. But there are opportunities to actually raise money from this state budget on this. Like I said, a lot has been done at the central government level. So now it is turn. It is the turn of the community leaders to actually apply for funding, create jobs, and deliver services accordingly. I'm sure there are a lot of training issues, how to train those social workers, but there are opportunities for that. The infrastructure is being created, but there are already means and opportunities for training. I understand that in the within decentralization, this issue will not be solved properly within a month or a year. And this reform is, of course, um, very important for us. I think it, we should be patient. I, uh, I think the time comes when the community leadership starts realizing the importance of this. But the state is taking a lot of steps for this framework to develop. We just need some time, and th all those issues will be settled. Thank you very much, Boris. I want to remind you that we had Boris Lebetsov, Deputy Social Minister of Ukraine. I'd like to ask you, Zoya, just in the end, tell us what would you advise to those parents who are still thinking about inclusive education for their children? Well, I'm glad that parents have the choice, either inclusive education or a specialized school or learning at home. This is a choice for everyone. Maybe inclusion is not good for everyone, but of course, People want to be protected, and they want to m make sure their children are protected. There are some concerns right now. If it doesn't work in the first instance, that might be stressful, but you got to try at least, because you can go to the institution anytime. It's important to have an alternative, to have the choice. I'm sure the choice should be out there, because children are so different, and parents probably know much better what their children need. And we should not expect very sh swift results. Because even in the first days at a regular school, my daughter was feeling tired every day. But it's been four years now, and she's getting much better now. Thank you very much, Vera. What about the wrap-up remarks from your side as a deputy, not as a deputy minister, but as just a citizen of Ukraine? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank our colleagues here, because this is not an easy question. And of course, it cannot be solved overnight. So we need to work and think about it. And we need to learn, first of all, every one of us. I'd like to also make sure our colleagues are responsive to parents. I listened to Daria, and uh, I was full of pride. And on the other hand, I thought, such a courageous woman, a mother, she is talking to the other people. Uh, she is talking not about the happy things, but so much work and so much effort has been invested into handling the case of her child. I'd like to also address this message to the people in education. Let us, let us work together to produce greatest results for the benefit of everybody. Inclusive education indeed must be here. Thank you very much, Vera. All right, dear friends. We realize today how much Ukraine has progressed in building barrier-free society. 
and we've heard of some of the important statements and we realize the path that we have to cover in front of us to build a country where everybody feels equal, where everybody feels accepted. And in order to build the country like this, we need to continuously raise this issue of inclusion. We need to talk about respect, acceptance and understanding each other. I want to remind you that today we have demonstrated three videos developed under the information campaign for children, society, barrier-free society. Hopefully, Ukrainian media will not be uh, reluctant. They will pick up this initiative and will be disseminating the videos. Therefore, you're going to have a very important societal mission as well. I'm talking to the media now. As part of the information campaign about inclusive education, we will be producing uh, outdoor advertising. So we want to ask the regional governments to support their placement. So I want to thank all the participants of the today's discussion, all the people here in the room, as well as those who were connected to us online. Hopefully this information campaign will make a valuable contribution into changing society's mindset and attitude to this issue. And hopefully the campaign will gather all of us, all the stakeholders, for efficient work in the future. We will be united to make sure one day inclusive education in a barrier-free society becomes real for each and every child in Ukraine. Thank you.